Good morning. I said good morning. There you go. That sounds a little bit better. Praise the name of the Lord. Welcome to Living Faith Church. We're glad that you're here this morning. Glad to have you with us. We've come this morning to praise and to worship our God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Come before his presence with singing. It also tells us in Psalms to clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, tells me that God always causes me to triumph in Christ Jesus. Amen? I proclaim to you this morning that you are triumphant. You are overcomers. If you've been born of the Lord, born of the Spirit, washed in the blood, you are victorious. And you know something? I think it's time that we acted like it. Amen? Let's raise to our feet and just begin to praise the Lord. Don't worry about anybody that's sitting beside of you. Turn her loose this morning and let her go. Get rid of all the restraints that's on you from cause of the things of the world and get into the Spirit and allow the Holy Ghost to lead God and direct you this morning as you worship the Lord. Father, we just thank you. We praise you. We magnify and glorify your holy name for another opportunity to come together to praise and to glorify your name. Holy Spirit of God, come now in the name of Jesus and minister as only you can minister. And we give you praise, honor, and glory and count it as done by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Go get it, you guys. Go get it. Master 
I thank the Savior Because He healed my heart You changed my day Forever free I'm not the same I thank the Master I thank the Savior
so be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve my praise you're the name of
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. The cross wasn't something, you know, that just happened in a moment. From the foundation of the world, the Lamb was slain. He was given the book of life so that he could write down each name that would receive him and accept him as Lord and as Savior. Oh, hallelujah. We need to really worship and praise God Amen. and magnify and glorify his holy name. He's alive. He's not dead. <clears throat> He's not in the tomb. Buddha's still laying over there, you know. I try to find his bones maybe, but praise the name of the Lord. Our God reigns. Our God's alive. He's real. He's somebody that you can know. He's somebody that you can have a relationship with. He's someone that you can talk to. He's someone that will walk with you and talk with you. He loves you. Beyond measure, we really can't comprehend the love that God has for us. He delights in us. He just twirls around over top of us. Why? Because he loves us. Amen. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy of our praise. Worthy of all glory. Worthy of all honor. Hallelujah. Let's just hit another note that worthy is the Lamb. All oh, glory to God. Just, you know, just hit a note of it and sing. Glory to God. Let's sing a little bit. Glory to God. We don't sing enough. Hallelujah. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I don't care what kind of noise you make. If it is a joyful noise unto the Lord. Hallelujah. If the Holy Ghost is moving you, baby, move. That's all I can say to you. Move if the Holy Ghost moves you. Glory to God. Let's just say it. seated if you want to be. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. I think right now it's time for the word. All announcements can come later. Praise the name of the Lord. While the Spirit's moving, let's hear the word of God. Morning. Welcome to Living Faith Church. How are you? My first start, give it up for Art Cry. Come and hanging out with us. Um, amen. Art Cry Live. I don't know how often that's happened. Art Cry Live. Uh, has it ever happened before? Has it ever happened? No, no tracks? Like a little bit? All right. Well, I liked it. Just saying. Uh, Benji didn't sing. It was even better. 
sing it solo. He didn't sing it solo. I heard his voice, though. I heard some harmony there going on in the background there a couple times. Sounded good. Benji and I have the same barber. Um, I call him Benji because y'all call him Ben. Um, but he was the best man at my wedding. And a real good friend of mine. It's good to always hang out with him and worship him. But thankful uh, for Heart Cry to come and, and lead us in the worship. Amen. Uh, this church is a worshiping church. Uh, this church is, we have a dynamic worship team. We've always had dynamic worship teams. We've always had an anointing that, that fell on this part of the ministry. Uh, and it, it continues. Uh, but we're always grateful uh, when other people come and bless us and bring, and bring song and worship and praise to us, right, in Jesus' name. Uh, so we're grateful for that. Uh, but we do, uh, we do thank you for coming. Uh, school is back in session. Right? I, my, my kid's a senior. I don't even have to get up. You know, I mean, we spend our whole lives getting kids up and putting them in the bed and making sure they have something to eat. And, man, Claire is, I won't lie, she is a self-sufficient 17-year-old, can drive herself, has her own set of wheels. And she, you know, there's days I get up and she's gone. I'm like, have a good day, Claire. <laughs> right? Uh, but she's, she, she just has a different greer to her that, that most of the kinders didn't have. Uh, some of them... Uh, <laughs> Some of them are still asleep, right? <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, but I'm glad school's back in session. We did pray for our kids and a covering for teachers and, and administrators. So we prayed for them last Sunday. Did you enjoy last Sunday? The kids invaded the sanctuary. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we, we had a children's church service on this stage. It was really cool. Uh, I preached a children's message on this stage to the kids. For those that weren't here, it was a really cool time. Uh, I had a lot of illustrations, which for my IQ level was perfect. Right, Tom Long come up to me and says, we need to do that more often. I said, do what more often? Illustrations. So I don't have any illustrations today, Tom, but Tom and I learn at the same level. We're visual learners, aren't we? We're just visual learners. Some people learn by seeing. Uh, other people learn by reading. Other people learn by, by, by observing. But some people learn by doing, right? They actually see and touch it, and that's how they learn. But we're, we, that was a blast. We are going to do it again sometime in the future, so I look forward for that. Um, we are having Wednesday. We have a nacho bar, so we're having Wednesday night. Good stuff. So Wednesday night, 6.30, absolutely positively free dinner. Come and eat with us. Bible study at 7 o'clock. Our youth pastor taught us this past Wednesday night. If you weren't here, uh, you missed Ryan teaching us. I thought Ryan did a great job. Uh, he, he's, he got the weed eater for Jesus out there, just knocking the weeds out of our lives. Good stuff. But excellent work, man. I really appreciated it. Uh, I believe in giving people opportunities right, uh, that they're not comfortable, always comfortable doing, right, and it puts them in preparation mode. I, I really believe in the ministry, preparation and opportunity do meet. You prepare and you prepare and you prepare, and there'll be an opportunity where they collide. And when, when they intersect, all that preparation and all that opportunity, all of a sudden they meet, guess what? You get time to do what God has given to you and what God's laid on your heart. It's exciting stuff, exciting stuff. Well, if you have your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, a couple verses of Scripture, you know you're getting old. Scott Poor looked at me this morning and laughed, which most days I'd laugh at myself too. I thought I may have left my glasses on the front row, and I walked in this morning. These are not my, these are backups. And I walked in this morning, and I, I just looked down, and I said, well, I marked that off the list. And he looked down and said, what is it? And I said, well, I, thought, I was hoping my glasses were laying on the front row, but they're not. Uh, but if you have your Bibles, Mark chapter 12, one verse of Scripture, a couple of verses, but we'll read Mark chapter 12 and Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 says, you, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And also in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, And calling the crowd to him, this is Jesus, his disciples, he said to them, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for this time of worship. Uh, we thank you that we can enter in into the presence of God uh, through song and through music. Uh, and Lord, we ask that this, what has began in this place will continue. Uh, Lord, water and grow uh, what is happening already in people's lives. Uh, may the word of God change us. May it challenge us. May it point us closer to the reality of who you are in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen and amen. I want to continue uh, the passionate series. Uh, we started the series a few weeks ago, uh, Passionate Pursuit. And that's what the Bible here tells us in Mark chapter 12. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Man, that's passion. That's passion. Amen. That's every fiber of my being. I'm supposed to love God. Every part of me. 
Every part of me. And I, then we read Mark chapter 8. When Jesus said, if you want to pursue me, is what he said, basically he was saying, if you want to pursue me, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow. I don't know about you, but when I'm following someone, I'm pursuing them, aren't I? There's a pursuit going on. Not a police chase pursuit. Not a blue light special, right? Anybody get pulled over this week? Jaden did? Oh, you didn't get pulled over? You didn't? Oh, that's the wrong question. No, I'm kidding. Right? Sometimes, how many of you got pulled over by a police car? In your life, not this week, not this morning. That's an awkward feeling, isn't it? Why is it that blue light just does something to our gut? <laughs> right? Right? When, when a cop is pursuing us, right? But you know what? When we're pursuing Jesus, that's, that's the type of chase it's supposed to be. Right? He's not, he's not slowing down to make us comfortable. He's not, he's not going to slow down the steps so we can catch up. It's our job to pursue. It's our job to follow him. And I believe our pursuit, if we're going to pursue Jesus, I believe it should be passionate. It should be full of passion. It should be full of life. It should be full of energy. It should be full of love. It should be full of peace. It should be full of all those things. In the very first three sermons, we looked at the fruit of the Spirit, right? We examined that our passionate pursuit, we must have passionate fruit to really pursue God. Well, today I want to share a message, passionate worship. If our pursuit is passionate, then I believe our worship must also be passionate. Let's talk about the word passionate. There's several meanings you find in the Webster's Dictionary. How many of you have a Webster's Dictionary? I have just the Thomas Dictionary in my house. Okay. Um, actually, now all we have phones, all right? We just have phones. We can Google everything. Remember that time we had like a talk show for you and we presented you this big dictionary? The Thomas Dictionary. Do you still have that? Don't answer. You don't have to answer right now. Uh, that was pretty. You probably do. You still have the 19. You, this guy here still has the Fiesta Bowl t sweatshirt when West Virginia played Notre Dame in 1989. Remember when we played for the National Championship? And that sweatshirt looked like it just came out of the store. It is pristine. It is white. It is immaculate. It's immaculate. So you probably still do have that somewhere at your house. Uh, store it up. I guarantee you do. Uh, but let's talk about the word passionate. It, the definition, it means enthusiastic, capable of, affected by, expressing intense feeling. Many of, us, if, many of us think that this relationship with Jesus Christ is like being on a playground. Ooh, slicky slide. Right? Ooh, swing, swing. Right? We're like a little kid on the playground. This is not what this is. The Bible says the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what he comes to do. Now, that doesn't sound like a recess, right? That doesn't sound like a playground, right? That doesn't sound like monkey bars. That doesn't sound like fun times, right? This isn't recess. This, is, this pursuit of Jesus Christ needs to be passionate. It needs to be a passionate pursuit. We got to survive on this planet. We need to be passionate people as Christians, you want to see a life change and get passionate about pursuing Jesus Christ. You want to see your life change, get passionate about pursuing Jesus Christ. As a follower of Christ, I should be consumed with Jesus. Just being honest with you. I should be consumed with Jesus. Everything I do in my faith walk should consume me. People who do very little are often the ones who complain the most. I'll be honest with you. The ones that do the least are the ones that complain the most. And that's relevant in every area of your life, right? At your house, right? At your job place. You ever notice that? That guy, huh? that guy don't do anything, but he complains the most, don't he? Y'all have somebody like that at work? Y'all have somebody like that at your house? I'm kidding. <laughs> right? Somebody's always complaining, but it's always the one who's doing the least. And I'm telling you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, my relationship with Jesus should be passionate. It should consume me. That, some of you have already been turned off by that. But I'm telling you this, this morning, the reality of who he is has changed my life. The reality of what he did on the cross of Calvary, raised from the dead three days later, has changed my life. Why? Because I accepted it and I believed it and I'm living my life according to the word of God. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I come up short. But guess what? I'm going to be passionate about this pursuit, just like my glass case just got passionate. I'm going to be passionate about it. And we are passionate about building the kingdom of God. You got it? And it shows itself in our service, in our giving, in our worship, if we're passionate. What some enjoy, I'm passionate about. What some people see is, oh, that's nice. I'm passionate about it. 
What some people see as a casual relationship with Jesus Christ. I see it as the very thing that motivates everything I do in life. It motivates me. It pushes me. It pushes me. Passionate people respond in passionate ways. Right? We went to the uh, Chicken Hawk and Herbert Hoover football game last night. They got postponed. Really good football game for, for one quarter. Uh, then Chicken Hawks beat the brakes off the Huskies for the next three quarters. Right? So me and Ryan and Lena and Kelly and Steve and Teresa, um, we heard some passionate people behind us screaming at the rest. I can't even show some of the hand gestures that were going forward. And they weren't saying they were number one. Uh, but there were some passionate people behind me screaming, right? They were passionate. They were yelling, right? Shouldn't we be the same way about Jesus? Shouldn't we be passionate about Jesus? Shouldn't, shouldn't the same energy level we bring to the football field, or to the baseball field, or to the basketball court, shouldn't we bring that to Jesus? Shouldn't we have that kind of passion? I'm not telling you, you have to tell him he's number one that way, Right? But shouldn't that, shouldn't that be the same type of passion we bring? Shouldn't that be the same energy level that we bring to Jesus? Passionate people do passionate things. Listen, this. passion unites us. Think about it. It unites us. You go to Morgantown. All right, next week, Mountaineers open up in Happy Valley. There's going to be 100,000 people. 97,000 of them are going to be Penn State fans dressed in white. They're united. Passion unites and I believe for us as Christians, we need to be passionate about Jesus Christ. And when we are, it unites the body of Christ. There's no more division when there's passion. We don't see, right, we don't see labels or names above a door. All we see is other passionate Christians. It unites us. And when we become passionate about Jesus and our pursuit is passionate, I believe it unites us. And that's my prayer for this series, and that it unites us here at Living Faith Church. It unites us with the common cause and with the common goal to see the kingdom come in Jesus' name. I want it to unite us, not divide us. I want it to unite. Our passion does not just help us. It motivates us. It pushes us. The pursuit of Jesus should be passionate. You know, a couple years ago, I worked for a great company. I have a great job. Um, God has blessed me beyond any Boone County boy should ever be blessed. Um, but every year you have an end-of-year review. And I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm, my reviews are always good. I, I, I give the best I got at work. I, I do the best I can. And this year I had a new boss. I've had like five bosses in five years. I mean, I, you know, I, I report to some high-level people, but they just keep changing chairs. And, uh, but this year I had a certain boss, and I was working from home that day. And I'll never forget, he called and he had a 90-minute block on my calendar to go over my annual review. Uh, and he starts talking to me and, and he says, you know, you're the most passionate, passionate environmental person I've ever seen. Like, you're, you're, you're the most passionate person I've ever seen in this role. I, I've never experienced that in anyone else. And he was trying to compliment me and I took it as a slap on the face. And I looked at him, and I, I really, I said this to my boss. I said, you don't know me very well. He said, what do you mean? I said, if you stuck me on that hillside out there and said, weed eat it, you wouldn't think I'm the most passionate weed eater outside of Scott Ford uh, that exists in Living Faith Church, right? If you said, hey, Don, go wash cars, you're going to think, my dude, that dude is the most passionate car washer I've ever seen in my life, Right? Passion is not what I do, it's who I am. It's the core of who I am. I'm tired of being identified in the workplace as a passionate person just because someone thinks I'm successful. Enough. They don't know me. That's Don Kinder. You stick me on a grill with a bunch of hot dogs, man. I'm passionate. Right? You give me a slab of brisket and a smoker. I'm passionate. It's not what I'm doing. It's who I am. And I want you to know as Christians, it's not what you're doing in the body of Christ. It's who you are in the body of Christ that should bring passion, that should bring energy, that should bring fire. That's what it is. And that's why I'm passionate. It's who I am. I want it to be who I am. And I want that passion to resonate in you. I want it to be inside of you. 
The same should be said of our walk with Christ. There should be no area in our lives as a Christian that should be done without passion. None. Zero. Christianity is not something we do. It's who we are. Therefore, worship is not something we do. It's who we are. Worship is our natural response. Worship becomes our natural response. Our daily response is worship. Worship is how we respond to the thing we value most. As humans, we're all worshipers. Every single one of us worships. We can't help it. It's who we are. It's what we do. It's how we're made. You don't believe me? Go look at Taylor Swift and her concerts. I'm not anti-Taylor Swift. Don't get me wrong. Uh, But man, she's packing it out. I think she just added like 10 or 12 more dates. I mean, she's making bank. That's why. I mean, if I could make that kind of bank, bring in a crowd and sing it, I'd do it too, right? Uh, but you know what the annual, you know what the annually in America estimated costs for live concerts are, revenue is? I mean, 31 billion just to go to a concert. 31 B, 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 not M, M, M. Billion. 31 billion. Now, I'm not saying everyone that goes to a concert is, ah, but most of them are, right? Why wow, they're passionate about it. They're passionate about it. They're worshiping something. They're worshiping. I'm not saying just because you go to a Taylor Swift concert that you're worshiping Taylor Swift, right? You may just like her music. You might like the vibe it gives off. And that's cool. I'm not even saying you're not a Christian if you go to that. But I'm telling you, you have to be careful because we all want to worship something. We all want to worship something. What you spend the most time thinking about doing or giving, most of your attention to is what you worship the most in our lives. For some of you, it's a car. For some of you, it's a four-wheeler. For some of you, it's a horse. Right? Some of you, it's a Jeep. Right? But whatever you spend the most time adoring or worshiping, that's what you're worshiping. We all have our own views of worship. Part, that's part of the problem, if I'm being honest. We think worship is about us and what we get from it. We walk into a church, we expect to be entertained. Because that happens in every area of our lives, doesn't it? We go to sporting events, we're entertained. We turn the TV on, we're entertained. We plug in our video game systems, we're entertained. So we think we should come to church and just plug in, entertain me! Right? That's what some people think. Worship isn't about being entertained. The definition of worship is reverent love and respect for deity. Our worship, our worship is about expressing our love for God and what he has done for us. Expressing love comes in many different formats. That's what we're going to look at today. I want you to know that worship isn't always about singing. Right? And I'm thankful for worship services. But worship isn't always about singing. That's where we get it wrong. Oh, if we don't sing five songs and one of them slow and two of them fast and one of them kind of in between, and if we don't stretch one out an extra six minutes and sing I exalt thee, then it wasn't worship, right? That's what, we, that's what we've got ingrained in our minds. Not that I, I do like I exalt thee, though. Great job this morning. We, we think that. It's, it, it's not that. It's not songs. Whether they be contemporary or traditional, slow or fast, rocking, electric guitar, or Kevin playing on, did you see Kevin playing on the bass? He was stepping into it. He was worshiping. He didn't matter a word, but he was worshiping with that instrument. He was worshiping this morning. He was worshiping. It's awesome stuff. It doesn't matter about any of that stuff. Whether it's saying a cappella, we can experience worship without any music at all. There are times in my life when I'll be driving and I simply come, as the song says, when all is stripped away, the music's faded, and thank God there's nobody else in the car but Don, right? And I start to sing, right? I think God is just as pleased with that as he is with this. He's just as honored with that, as long as you're not doing 95, right? Of course, you could say you're redeeming the time for the days are evil. And you better be singing a fast song because you're going 95. All right, you better be singing some Petra. He's just as honored with me, you 10 2 worshipers, right? The 10 2 steering wheel folk, giving it all to Jesus as he is with this. 
Our worship must be passionate in every area of our lives. He's just as honored. We've got to get passionate about worshiping Jesus, not just when it's your favorite song, not just when you have a mic in your hand, not when you're on stage. We just need to worship him despite the song, despite where we are. From the stage to the back row, just worship. When the music fades, and all is stripped away. And I just come. I just come. Good, bad, or indifferent, I just come. That's passion. That's life-altering time with God. The Bible says in Psalm 29, To give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The term worship is like many other great words, such as grace and love. They're difficult to define, aren't they? It's hard to paint a picture using words to explain grace and love and worship. It's hard to do that. It's like trying to tell someone what a rose smells like, right? It's like trying to tell someone what a Frank's calzone with pepperoni, ham, cheese, and sausage tastes like. You just can't do it with words. You can't explain that calzone with words. You've got to experience it, right? I'm on a French calzone today. Can we get one? <laughs> They're open until like 2 a.m. now. You can order online. They'll meet me in Glasgow, I think. Delivery from Mink Shoals. But it's hard for me to put into words what, what a calzone tastes like, right? But man, once you've experienced it, right? It changes your life. So there's three things real quick I want to look at about worship. And I'm different. They're going to be like, whoa, I never thought about that. Or you, dude, you're strange. I get it. Number one, worship is more than singing. Worship is more than singing. Romans chapter 1, verse 25. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Man, you ever get in a debate at work? People start questioning your faith and what happens if this or what about this or what about some person on an island in the middle of nowhere who lives by themselves and what happened? Man, just go to Romans chapter 1, say, read that, get back to me. Read Romans chapter 1 and get back to me, right? But this here tells me everyone's worshipers because we've traded. We've traded what we had for something else. We've exchanged. Some versions of the Bible use the word exchange. We exchanged. I like the word traded a little better. I believe that's what King Jimmy says is traded because it's like going to the car lot and trading in a car. Right? You go to the car lot and trade in your car. Guess what? You don't get to drive off in the thing you traded. Right? You don't get to keep both cars when you trade it. And there are people in the world who have experienced the power and the favor of God who have traded or exchanged their worship for something else. Guess what? This verse tells me I don't get to do both. I'm only driving one car. I don't get to drive two. Because if you want two, you don't trade it in. Right? You keep the car. Worship is more than singing. When you realize this is not a hobby... Serving Jesus is not a hobby. A hobby means an activity done regularly. You're going to think this is going to sound churchy. An activity done regularly in one's leisure time for pleasure. That's a hobby. Hobbies are golf. That's a hobby. Right? Serving Jesus is not a hobby. It's a full-time, life-altering, life-changing experience. This is not a hobby. This is real. This is real life. Let me declare to you today, a passionate pursuit of Jesus is not a hobby. This is not a leisure time moment. This is life-altering, life-defining relationship with Jesus Christ. Worship is not just for Sunday mornings now. I want you to know that this morning. Worship is not just for Sundays. We don't have Sunday night services very often, so guess what? I can use Sunday mornings. We'll just use Sunday mornings, right? Worship is not just for Sunday mornings. Worship is not a roped-off 
just for church. It's not. We got this perception that this sanctuary is roped off for us to come into. And on Sunday mornings, they take the ropes off and we get to come and worship. It's not just for that. Worship is all the time. And it's more than a song. This is not a weekend warrior mentality. Look, I'll be honest with you today. Jesus is my identity. I'll be honest with you today. He is my identity. Not what I do in my day job. My relationship with Kelly, my wife, is not my identity. My relationship with my children is not my identity. My relationship with my grandchildren is not my identity. My identity is found in Jesus Christ. And when that identity is right, when that relationship is correct, all other parts of my life fall in the line. All other parts of our life go back to where they need to be. Why? Because my relationship is where it needs to be. It's got to be him first. And when he's not first, every other aspect of my life is out of sync. It's out of balance. He is my identity. Not what I do. It's who I am in Jesus Christ. Real worship is a full-time, non-stop activity of every believer. And the fact that we exist ought to be enough for us to please God. And I have to please Him with every aspect of my life. Not just my singing, thank God. Not just in my musical capabilities, thank God, because I can play nothing. I don't know if I can whistle well. No, I can't whistle well. Right? I can snap. I mean, I'm that guy, even back in the day at Living Faith Church, we used to have to rock the tambourines. They never gave me a tambourine. Right? I was the Baptist, or I was Methodist, but I'd be the Baptist tambourine player. I'm off beat, you know what I mean? You ever go to, go to like a football game and you hear people start clapping? You know who the Baptists are? That guy. He's behind, right? He's two claps behind. But, but it, it's not based on any of that. It's just me. It's just me coming to Jesus. In my daily work, what I do every day, I believe I'm worshiping God. How I perform for my employer, I believe I'm worshiping God. How, I'm, how often I mow my grass at home and keep my yard neat and my house clean for Kelly and us uh, is, is, is a sign of God, right? Let's be honest. Am I wrong? Worship is not contained to here. My life for Jesus Christ is not contained to here. I mean, would you think, Pastor Don, you haven't mowed your grass for 12 weeks. I mean, if my, if my grass was up to my thigh... What would you think about me? Seriously, you drove by my street. Really? He loves Jesus? He loves Jesus? Every part of my life should be impacted by this relationship with Jesus Christ. Everything. Everything I do. It's more than singing. It's more than singing. The flip side, I, I, if you do not truly worship God, everything in your life is out of whack, it's out of sync. The flip side of this is if you are a true worshiper, I have seen nothing that can accelerate your spiritual growth like worship. I've seen nothing in my years on this planet that accelerates spiritual growth faster than someone learning to worship God. When God is worshiped in spirit and in truth, the kingdom of God is established. And when his kingdom is established, then freedom comes, is what the Bible tells me. And the works of the enemy are defeated in my life when the kingdom is established. We're not part of a short-term boost. This is a lifetime plan, right? This is a lifetime plan. There is no installment plan, right, on worship. I'm going to come back and get the rest of it later. There isn't any of that, right? This is a lifetime, life-altering, life-changing, 100% of the time experience with Jesus Christ. I want to close this point with this. I want you to listen to this really carefully. It's time to stop watching others live the life you want to live. It's time to stop watching. So many times we watch someone else live the life we want to live spiritually. When we just watch others, we lose our passion. And when all we're doing is watching them. Number two, point number two, do not confuse volume for passion. Huh. Do not confuse volume or loudness for passion, right? Again, I'll go back to the football game last night. We heard some nice, common referee jesters. I did throw out, go back to Foot Locker once, and Kelly elbowed me. Uh, there was one bad call. There was at least one bad call, but it didn't change the game. It didn't change the game, I promise you. It had no bearing on the outcome of the game. 
right? But we heard some passionate people who were loud, they had a lot of volume, but come the fourth quarter, they had nothing to say, right? And so many times we think that, that how loud we are shows passion. Well, it doesn't always show passion. Loudness, volume doesn't always show passion. Volume can say you're angry. It's all last night, right? Volume can say you're, you're, not, you're not where you need to be, right? You're frustrated. You're disappointed, right? All those words are all negative words. That doesn't always, that doesn't, look, I'm not saying you can't be loud in your worship. I'm not saying you can't be loud when you worship God or serve God, all right? But I'm here to tell you, don't base loudness or volume as passion because it's not always such. That's not always the case. How many of you know some loud people? Everything they do is loud, right? Everything. They breathe loud, eat loud, sleep loud, right? Loud people. My family probably ranks me in that category. Some people are quieter than others when they walk, when they eat, when they sleep. <laughs> I'm not one of those people, I've got to tell you. I'm a loud guy. I'm a loud guy. And when someone is loud, again, it can mean they're angry or frustrated. It also means that they, they can have some passion, though, if you're loud. There, there is some passion when you're loud, but sometimes it's misguided passion. I think that what we have uncovered in my passion can be loud, but it should also not be annoying. I can be passionate about Jesus Christ and not be annoying. And Tom, this is for you. You go to your favorite grocery store. And we've all been there. I think Lowe's right now ranks the highest. Sam's is right below him. And you get that buggy. How many of you ever got that buggy? You got that buggy. I mean, they, you're just walking Sam's Club. You just showed your photo ID, right, to get in. And they can hear you back there where the chickens are turning. You know what I mean? Because you got that buggy. We've all got that buggy before, Right? What I find funny about that buggy, after a point in time, you'll find them just idly sitting in the aisle somewhere, don't you? People have given up on it because it's too noisy. It's too annoying. It's loud, right? I mean, how many of you ever left a buggy in the middle of an aisle? Raise your hand. Jesus is watching. Don't you lie. Right? That buggy has told me, I don't want you. Right? And we don't want that buggy. How many of you know there are quiet buggies in that place that get the same job done, Right? Now, I do, I do try to say, pay attention now when I go buggy shopping. I look at, man, if you, that, that back wheel is worn out. If it, I saw one at Lowe's, there was no wheel. I was like, not pushing that, all right? Not pushing that guy, because I know what that guy's going to sound like. That's what I'm saying. Volume always doesn't mean passion. When we are loud for Jesus, it shouldn't be annoying. Does that make sense? shouldn't turn people off, Right? People shouldn't want to run from you. They should want to run to you. Why? Because we're lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. You can't confuse, though, volume with passion because it's not always there. Our worship can be loud and proud, but sometimes it's okay to have a quiet buggy, too. Am I wrong? Sometimes it's okay to be quiet and still worship. I do, I do not always have to be loud in my worship. I do not always need more volume. I do not always need everyone to hear my worship. Sometimes it's just me and God. I promise you, you need that alone time. Corporate worship is awesome. I love corporate worship. I'm, I love the worship. I'm, they, we, Marion sent us a, a, a meme or something the other day asking what kind of worshiper we are. Of course, I'm, they just call me the airplane worshiper. <laughs> right? I'm the airplane guy. I mean, I'm just an airplane worshiper. My arms just go out. Right? I just, I just, I just how I worship. I love to worship. I've been raised in this church for 30 plus years, and man, we're worshipers. I mean, you learn to worship God in this sanctuary, right? And that, that's just how I worship. That's, that's me. But that's not loud, is it? I can do this and not sing. I can do this at the pool. I can do this at the office. I can do this at the dining room table. I probably shouldn't do this driving. All right? Unless I got a really good knee. All right. I, pr I, I pray you don't do this up Golly Mountain because your knee ain't that good. All right. We'll find you at the bottom of Hawk's Nest. 
right? But my worship doesn't always have to be annoying. It doesn't always have to be loud. It can be quiet. That's just a point God gave me. I told you I'm weird. I just wanted to share it with you. I'm not a quiet person. Part of the, because my hearing is what it is, right? I'm loud at times just because I can't hear myself. Uh, it's not a bad thing to me, but to the world around me it is. Uh, I sing loud, I clap loud, I yell loud, but that volume does not, does not always show passion. We need to make sure our worship is not loud for the wrong reasons. For the wrong reasons. Last point, real quick. Turn to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he was reclining at a table, and a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment, of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. I'm speaking of Jesus. And there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why has this ointment been wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. Huh. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. Gosh, that's powerful. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand, before my burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Man, first of all, we just fulfilled prophecy in this place this morning. Jesus says, in the future, this lady's story is going to be told for what she did for Jesus Christ. We did that this morning. Prophecy has been fulfilled in your midst because Jesus said it would happen. So here we read. First of all, I, want, I challenge you real quick. Um, you'll find three, three instances of an alabaster box in the Gospels. And, and all of them, two, Mark and John both give an account right after the triumphal entry, towards the end, right before Jesus was arrested. But Luke actually gives an account in chapter 7, which is right after he called the disciples, long before he was arrested. So I challenge this week as a church, I want you to read those three. Three, and I think two of them are the same story. I think there's actually two instances in the Gospels based on what I've studied this week. What Jesus had alabaster was broken on him. All right. But study that and get back to me on Wednesday night uh, for those. We're also going to be studying a Mark chapter 17 Wednesday night. So I need you all to read that and get back to me as well. Y'all going to read Mark chapter? Is everyone going to read Mark chapter 17? All right. There's only 16 chapters. I'm going to warn you now. Okay. <laughs> only 16 chapters in the gospel of Mark. So if you get to 17, come and see me. <laughs> but Jesus was the guest of honor, right? He, and at this gathering, he sits, he eats, and, and Mary enters the room with an alabaster box of perfume. And in verse 5, we read the small container of perfume is very valued. It's, it's 300. 300 denarii is what the Bible says. 300. A full year's salary for the average worker. An entire year she carried in a little box. That's how valuable which, and the alabaster box, once it was broken, there would be no going back. When she broke this box, there was no going back. All would be laid bare before Jesus. And this is all the moment that she gets to Jesus as he's sitting at his feet. Of course, some disciples were stunned. They were shocked for all the wrong reasons, right? Whoa, 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 whoa. And notice they didn't say nothing until after it. After she broke it. After she began pouring out this perfume on Jesus is when they started barking, right? After the fact. Isn't that how it always works? They never complain when you're doing it. They always complain after, right? They always complain after. And, and, and she's pouring this out on Jesus, and, and they saw a business opportunity. They saw a line item. They saw a, a balance sheet is what they saw. And they said, we could sell that and give to the poor. And let's be honest, that sounds like a great idea. That sounds like a great concept. But that was not the reason for their complaints. Some people actually believe that Judas was the one that was most vocal because he carried the treasury bag, right? Uh, there is a thought process that Judas tipped into that treasury bag, right, over time. And he got what he needed for himself. 
But the disciples were angered by this action and vocally criticized her for wasting. They said she were wasting the perfume. But let me tell you something about this story. She wasn't there for them. She wasn't there for them. She wasn't there for the disciples. She wasn't trying to impress them. She was there for her Savior. That's a powerful lesson that we all can learn when we worship. We're not here for anyone else. When we corporate worship, I'm not here for for Joe, even though I like Joe, and I think Joe's an awesome guy. I'm not here for him. I'm here for Jesus. I'm not here for anyone else. Only Jesus. The song says, you weren't there the night he found me. He wasn't there when he wrapped his loving arms around me. Gosh, don't let anyone ever stop you from worshiping. Don't let anyone ever mute your story. And why you worship. Because they weren't there when Jesus found you. They weren't there when you were rescued. The bottle of perfume was worth one year of wages for the average worker. A f- Listen to this. A f- this came to me uh, Friday night. A full year's salary was poured on Jesus. A full year. Her entire salary for a year, that's the equivalent of that, was just poured on to Jesus. A year of her life. What, what she could have, could have sold and sustained her for an entire year. Paid all her bills. Handled all every problem she would have had financially. She poured out on Jesus. An entire year. An entire year. Gosh, that's powerful. You see, worship is more than singing. It's more than playing. It's more than standing in a building where it's comfortable, where it's popular. To me, I worship Jesus with the effort I give at work. I worship him when I'm done and done to the least of these. That's worship. I'm giving all I have for a king who gave everything to me. But Jesus puts a stop to the criticism. One of the things so awesome about the story, Jesus shuts him up. That's what he does, right? He takes the naysayers and shuts him up. He tells the disciple to leave her alone because she has done good work for him. He says they can help the poor anytime they want. You could have been helping the poor yesterday, big boy. But you chose not to. You just want to complain. You just want to complain. Sometimes we need to realize with worship we give what we have and we give where we are. Those things mean you can only give what you have. In other words, my worship can only be my worship. It can only be mine. It's not Frank's worship. It's not Ryan's worship. It's not Kelly's worship. It's not Scott's worship. They can only worship how they worship. But my worship is my worship. It's mine and mine alone. Not what someone else and their worship looks like. We also need to learn to worship where we are. It may not always be the best place. But remember, it's always the right place to worship. It's always the right place. Of course, Jesus goes on to state about the gospel. And we we fulfilled that this morning when he said she'll be talked about for generations for what she has done today. As I close up, I want to point out a few more points, and I want you to really ponder these. The alabaster box contained something that was very precious. But if it stayed in the container, it didn't benefit anybody. She keeps it in the box. No one benefited. No one. If you keep the worship in your box, it doesn't benefit anyone. It only benefits yourself. Powerful point. Powerful point. John says in chapter 12, when the perfume was poured out upon Jesus, that its fragrance filled the entire house. The entire house. Whatever it smelled like before was changed by that moment in time where she worshiped Jesus. It changed the atmosphere. All because she gave. That's powerful. It's powerful. When the perfume was poured out on Jesus, when we worship Jesus, it changes the atmosphere you find yourself in. Here's the thing about worship. We made the feeling or the emotion more valuable than the one we're worshiping. God doesn't require some kind of perfect, complicated worship act. It doesn't have to be all put together. If that's what you think, then you're missing out what worship is all about. He just wants it to be authentic, And he just wants to be genuine. 
Worship is not about the band or the songs that you're singing. It's about carving out time to get alone with God. And I want our worship to be passionate. So I want to close this service. When she broke that alabaster box, she was bringing every broken part, every cracked part of her life and says, I'm going to give it to Jesus. And maybe your life is broken. Maybe your life is cracked. Maybe your life doesn't feel like it's all put together. Guess what? To bring to Jesus. You can come to him just as you are. And if you, that's you this morning, I challenge you. I challenge you to be like her. She wasn't concerned about what others would say. She wasn't concerned about what others would think. Her heart was focused on her king. The story holds a wonderful picture of what a heart of worship looks like. It's not a show. It's not bright lights. It's not loud music. It's not trying to impress, but a heart that fully seeks God and seeks to honor Him. Did you notice in the story that we read, she didn't sing, did she? I'm not diminishing singing. I love, I love it. But she brought what she had to Jesus. She brought where she was to Jesus. She didn't clean up. She didn't try to get better. She came as she was. There's a, there's a worship song I've been jamming out to for the last several weeks, last several months. It's called Even Here by Lydia Lord. And I love this line. It says, we worship when the storm is relentless. We worship when the battle is endless. We worship in the middle of the in-between. Huh, I've never been there. In-between. In-between. The... In the middle of my questions, I still worship. When the song closes, it says, sometimes the nothing left to give. How many of you have been there where you feel like you have nothing left to give? I, guess I don't have anything left to give. The song says, sometimes that becomes the sweetest offering. <laughs> that moment when you say, I have nothing left to give. God says, that's the sweetest offering you could bring. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you feel like you have nothing left to to give because you're broken, you're cracked, you're not put together. And sometimes choosing just to sing is the thing that changes everything. Let us pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you as our pursuit is passionate for you that you will create in us a desire to worship you in every aspect of our lives. In everything that we do and everything that we say, not just in a building, not just in a song, but that our worship will be passionate as we pursue you. So Lord, as we enter into this altar time, I pray for hearts. Lord, I know there are broken people here. I know there are people here who feel like they're cracked or, or unusable. Lord, I pray today that you will encourage them just as Mary brought her gift to Jesus. It wasn't perfect. She wasn't perfect but she broke it anyway because she brought her hurt, she brought her pain to the King of Kings. So if you're in this place this morning, keep your eyes bowed, heads bowed and eyes closed real quick. If you're in this place this morning and you're, you feel like you have nothing left to give, would you raise your hand up and down real quick? Say, Don, that's me. I just want to pray. Anybody at all? You're in a place where I see that hand. Anybody at all? I have nothing less to give. I see that hand and that hand. God bless you. You've given all you can and you feel like you're empty. Maybe you're in this place and you feel like you're cracked or broken. You feel like you're unusable. You feel like that God has not really forgotten you or that you've forgotten God, but you're in this place, as we said, you're in between. You're not where you need to be, but you're not where you were, and, and you're kind of trapped in this little lull of, of what I call in between. And if that's you this morning and you just want prayer, would you raise your hand up and down real quick? I see that hand and that hand and that hand and that hand. God bless you. Lord, we want to worship you in every area of our lives. May our passion be guided in the right direction. May our volume be turned up when it needs turned up. And Lord, may we realize that you are our identity and we can worship you anywhere and any way. 
Bible says David, 2 Samuel 6, he, he became undignified at the presence of God. And sometimes it's okay to become undignified. So Lord, continue to move from Living Faith Church. Continue to lead us. Lord, all those hands that went up for prayer, Lord, we ask they were encouraged today that they see value in their lives, those that are cracked or broken. You can restore and you can heal. Those who have nothing left to give, Lord, give them value and purpose. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You have an amazing week. God bless you all. See you Wednesday night.